Okay, there we go. Um, but if I were you, I would check in power school um, because that's where I look. I don't even really look at the grades in here. They supposedly automatically transfer, this program automatically transfers your grades from Canvas into power school. I haven't seen that as being really great so far. Um, so if I have to make any changes or updates or, or anything like that to grades, I do it in power school. That's the only place you're going to see any updates. For example, if you take a quiz in this class um, during second period or during third period and it's automatically graded, it won't even post into power school until midnight. And even then, sometimes they just don't post and I have to enter them manually. So if you're going to check your grades, please be sure and check your grades in power school. Um, next, um, the way you're graded in this class. For the most part, a large portion of your grade is going to be based on your attendance to these meetings every day. Um, you get five points a week for every day that you're supposed to be here. Every day that you're not here, you lose a point. The difficulty in that for you guys is that you cannot make those points up. At the end of the semester, if you had 15 days that you didn't make it to class and there's 15 points and that's dropped you to an F, there's not a thing you can do about it. You can't go back and show up for a class. On the other hand, any quizzes or tests or anything like that I give you, um, I generally make those so they can be retaken for a better grade at any point in time up until the end of the quarter. So that is one way you can improve your grade if, it's, if you haven't scored as well as you'd hoped on something. But when it comes to attendance, um, you cannot fix that. You cannot make up a grade in attendance, okay? So uh, be aware of that, okay? So for today, um, well, I shouldn't say for today. Let's take, let's look at it this way. They're, they're talking about bringing you guys back part-time. It's called a hybrid schedule. Um, don't ask me how that's gonna work because I don't think anybody here knows yet. But um, depending on when they would bring you back, okay? I mean, if they bring you back the last week of the quarter, there's not a whole heck of a lot that's gonna get done, right? It's just not gonna happen. If they bring you back with three or four or five weeks to go in the quarter, we're going to have to get some stuff done, okay? We're gonna to have to get some work done. Um, in order for you to be able to do that, you have to pass the safety test first. You guys all know that if you've taken this class before um, in person, um, you know that you have to pass the safety test with 100% before you're allowed to work in the shop. You have three opportunities to pass that test. If you do not pass it after the third attempt, you're removed from class, okay? Um, so those of you that have not been in this shop before in person, you're probably not aware of that. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that over the course of the next few weeks, we spend some time preparing you to pass the safety test the day that you show up or the day after you show up. In other words, we're not going to take a week or two weeks to prepare for this. You've got time now to prepare for it. I've got time now to help you prepare for it. Okay, so that's one of the things we're going to be doing. We're also going to go back to basics and try to teach you from square one how to process material and get it ready for use in a piece of furniture. Um, it seems to be a, a big sticking point for a lot of you, just understanding the absolute basics of how to move through this shop. So we're going to work on that, okay? Um, other than that, we'll have this and that to do. Um, we'll try to keep you awake as best we can. I know it's difficult. Um, probably as messed up as it is sitting in this shop with nobody here and as quiet as it is. It's just not pleasant. So if you'll take a look, this is where um, you'll go um, if you missed a day or if you're curious about what's going on or if you want to review something that we went over, um, you'll go to the modules page, okay? Now, I already have something in Tuesday here. And what I have in Tuesday is the initial preparation for the safety test, okay? So what I'm going to do is I just thought I'd try it this way and see what happens. We're going to go over um, the basic steps in preparing a piece of material for use in a piece of furniture and the order in which you would do those steps, the machines that you would use to accomplish those steps, and the safe operating practices in using those machines.
okay? So the machines that we intend to cover over the course of one class, for example, today, um, I'm going to try and pull all the questions from the safety test and put them on that day's module. In other words, today we're going to talk about um, the initial squaring of a board, um, basically the joiner, the planer, and the table saw. So all the questions that have to do with the joiner, planer, and the table saw have been pulled from the safety test and they are in this module. The answers in blue are the correct answers, okay? So, um, and I wanna do this in order um, as much as possible so that um, you guys are embedded in your understanding regarding what order we walk through the shop and what machines we do first, okay? So um, let's take a quick look at something else first, okay? And we'll come back to this at a later time. So, uh, Noah, if you, if you contact me via email and you have clearance through attendance as an excused absence, yes, you will still get the point for that day. If it's not an excused absence that has been made through the attendance office, then no, you'll be marked absent. So if, if you're going to be absent or you know you're going to be absent or you're sick one day, you still need to call the front office, get a hold of attendance and let them know that you're not going to be here. Okay. Um, the more you contact me, the better. I mean, the more I know what's going on, the easier it is for all of us and the easier I'm going to make it on you. So yeah, being in contact with me and letting me know what's going on, it will, will go a huge long way in keeping everybody sane. Okay. Um, and so you guys know, um, you can email me anytime. I generally check my emails starting at about five o'clock in the morning till about six o'clock at night. And I usually check them on weekends as well. So if you have questions or concerns or anything like that, um, you're welcome to email me at any time, okay? So, um, and I also thank you very much for using this chat. I appreciate it when people ask questions in this chat and show that they're paying attention, all right? So here we go. So the first thing I wanna talk to you guys about is some really, really basic terminology. Um, for example, this is the face of this board. There's two faces, one here, one here, both faces, right? Same here, face of a board, face of a board. This happens to be the edge, this happens to be the opposite edge, and these are the two ends of a board. Okay, now that may sound really, really simple, okay? But how do you know which of these surfaces, here, 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 and here, how do you know which of those surfaces would be considered the edge and which of those surfaces would be considered the ends, okay? There's really only one way to know, and that's by measuring the surfaces. For example, the largest surface on this board Okay, it's gonna be a face. Okay, so there's a large surface. There's a large surface, those are the faces. Then if we measure the length of these other surfaces, this is about 12 and a quarter inches long. This is just a little bit under 12 inches long. Okay, so that makes this 12 and a quarter inch surface an edge. That makes that the opposite edge. That makes these ends. So when we're talking about the terms face, edge or end, the only thing we're discussing is the dimensions of that board. It's a measurable thing. I can measure this and tell you how many square inches are on the surfaces board. If that's more than how many square inches are on any other surfaces, that's a face. If the next largest surface or the next longest surface is this one, that's an edge. The shortest is an end, okay? That matters because when we go over the table saw, what do we have to put against the fence every single time? We have to put the long edge against the fence. When we go to the joiner, we have to put the long edge against the fence. When we go to the miter saw, we have to put the long edge against the fence, okay? We never put the ends against the fence on those machines, okay? Now, there's another characteristic of the material we use. Now, so we have basically two different types of material. One of them is broken down into two, two parts. We have solid stock, which is our pine, poplar, alder, make, oak, oak, or oak, cherry. And we have sheet goods, particle board, 
um, MDF, plywoods, things like that. Okay, two very different but very similar materials. They share some characteristics and they are widely different in other characteristics. For example, a lot of the sheet goods we use have no grain. There's no grain direction. I put a stain on this surface of this piece of red oak so you could maybe see the grain a little bit better on it. There is grain on solid stock. Whether it's a softwood like pine or hardwood like oak or cherry or maple, there is grain. Okay, and you can usually tell the grain direction, right? The grain direction in this board is along the length of it. Okay, so there are certain terms that follow that same idea. For example, this is the largest surface on this board, but this is also face grain. Okay, so this is a face, but it is also face grain. This is the longest edge on this board. So this is edge grain. Okay, so it's, it's an edge of a board. It's also edge grain because it is edge grain. I look at it, I can tell. I know it's edge grain. When we talk about these other surfaces, the smallest surfaces on the board, that is an end. And on this particular board, that so happens to be end grain as well. You look at a board like this, it's a piece of maple. The grain direction in this board is that way. Okay, in other words, when this was in the tree still, it was like this, okay? That makes this surface right here, as well as this surface right here, that makes those two surfaces end grain, okay? End grain, face grain, face grain, edge grain, edge grain. If we go by dimensions alone, like we did with this particle board, this would be an edge, this would be an end because this surface is longer than this surface. So this is our edge, right? But it is end grain, okay? It might be called an edge, but it's not edge grain, it's end grain. The grain, face grain, edge grain, end grain, is a physical characteristic of the material. Whereas the edge, the end, or the face is a dimensional characteristic, I can measure it. But when it comes to face grain, edge grain, or end grain, that's not something I, I can measure. It's a visible, physical characteristic of the material. And the reason that's important is that number one, the long edge has nothing to do with grain, has to do with dimensions. The long edge of a board always goes against the fence of the table saw, always goes against the fence of the joiner, the dado saw, the, the miter saw. But the way your material reacts to being machined, Okay, for example, when you run a router bit along the edge of this board to put a decorative profile or a roundover or something like that on it, the way this board reacts to that bit or that cutting tool or that blade is different if you're cutting or routing in grain as opposed to edge grain as opposed to face grain, okay? So the way this board reacts to being machined is partly dependent on the grain that's being machined right whereas the way that you feed a board into a machine or put it against a fence is a function of the dimensions of that board okay so that's kind of the basics of those terms all right so hopefully you understand those terms and it's clear to you now i'm going to ask a question in the chat and you're going to have about 10 or 15 seconds to answer And all you have to answer is yes or no, okay? And I'm talking about this right here. So if you do not answer, I, will only, I can only assume that you are disengaged from the class and your name will be sent to the front office for a call to mommy and daddy or whoever takes care of you, okay? And this is, this is nice because this lets me know if, you know if I've lost you guys or you're paying attention or what. I don't want to lose you. I know some of it's boring as heck, but um, we'll do the best we can, okay? So from what it looks like, all right, I'm gonna, Drayden, Drayden, you're on the right track, okay? All right, so I'm gonna stop that. I'm just gonna type in so I know it's done. All right. So 
Drayden was on the right track, okay? When I ask if this board is square, okay, I'm not talking about its dimensional characteristics. I'm not talking about um, whether or not this distance is the same as this distance. That has nothing to do with square in regards to how we look at it in this shop. When I talk about square in this shop, what I'm talking about is 90 degrees, okay? The whole idea of going to the joiner, the planer, back to the joiner, to the table saw, the miter saw, to get a piece of material to final dimensions that it calls for in the plans, the whole idea of that is while we're getting a board to its final dimensions, say we want it to be a half inch thick, 12 inches long and three inches wide, okay? The whole process involved in that also includes getting this square. In other words, there are how many surfaces on this board? There's one, two, three, four, five, six different surfaces on this board. Every single surface on this board needs to be touched. I'm assuming this is solid software. Let me switch to this. Sheet goods is a different story. I don't want to confuse you. One, two, three, four, five, six different surfaces. Every one of these surfaces on this board has to be touched or machined or milled at some point before you can use it in a piece of furniture. You cannot walk around with a board and get ready to assemble it into a piece of furniture if it's got orange paint on the end of it that was left from when you got it off the rack. That means that surface has not been touched. Every single surface needs to be milled, needs to be cut, needs to be treated in some way every time okay so the goal here is to create 90 degree corners or 90 degree angles at every single junction of two surfaces wherever two surfaces meet there are 12 different 90 degree angles that are required on a board like this okay edge to that face this edge to this face, this edge to the upper face, this edge to the lower face. That's four different 90 degree angles, okay? This end to this face, this end to this face, this end to this face, this end to this face. That's four more. That's a total of eight angles so far that have to be 90 degrees. This end to this edge, 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 or four more. So there's 12 different junctions or points of intersection, if you will, between surfaces that have to be 90 degrees, okay? That's the idea of milling your lumber down to final dimensions that it calls for in the plans. You have to have those 90 degree angles. All right, so how do we get that done using the least amount of effort and the least amount of contacts with machines. In other words, it may take six different processes on four different machines to get this board completely square, all 12 angles. It may take 12, depending on how you move through the shop and which machines you use in which order. The goal here would be to have as little contact between board and machine as possible to accomplish that task, getting it square. In other words, the more machines you take this board to, the more times you cut on it, mill it, plane it, whatever, to get it to square, the better the chance for an error. The fewer machines you use to get it to that point, the better the chance for no errors, okay? So what we call our order of operations in this shop is a very important definition or term. The order of a basic definition of the order of operations in our shop is the order in which you mill the surfaces of this board and the order in which you use the machines to accomplish that. And we do faces first. We do both faces first. Then we do the edges. Then we do the ends. Faces, edges, ends in that order every time. Now there are exceptions to every rule and in this shop there's always an exception to a rule. But as far as you guys are concerned, until one of those exceptions come up, you will always do the faces first, then you'll do the edges, then you'll do the ends. It's called the fee system, F-E-E, -E, faces, edges, ends. And that's a test question on the safety test. 
So now that we know the difference between dimensional analysis of a board and structural or physical analysis of a board, in other words, faces, faces, edges, edges, ends, ends, or face, grain, edge, grain, end, grain. Um, and we also know what the definition of square is in this shop. Um, we start the process of, of getting a board ready for use, in other words, squaring it, okay? Now, why do you have to square a board? So we're gonna take a look at the joiner and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So that is going to be, okay. All right, so there's a lot of different, what you could call defects in solid stock lumber. Now we're not talking about sheet goods right now, folks. We're talking about solid stock, okay? Here's a good way to know that. On the joiner, we're not allowed to use sheet goods, only solid stock. So if I'm standing the joiner, we're not even having a discussion about sheet goods. Ignore sheet goods for now. That's not what we're talking about, okay? So if you take random pieces of material from a rack over here, you might notice something. If you ever wanna see how straight or flat or nice a piece of material is, place it on the table saw or the joiner or the dado saw because these machine surfaces are gonna be the flattest ones we have in the shop. Do not rely on the bench tops, they're not flat. So if I take just a random board, let me zoom in on this a little bit so you can see it. Oh. Okay, and I set it on this joiner. All right. So I've got it on a flat surface here, okay? If I put a finger on this corner, a finger on the opposite corner, I can rock it. You guys should be able to see that rocking on there. That tells me that there is a slight twist to this board, okay? I flip it over, same thing, okay? So this board has a twist. In other words, if I took the end of this and the other end and I twisted it like this, it's twisting in that direction, okay? So here's another example. He's bald, okay? So I'm gonna set it on here. I don't really have any twist. There's a tiny little bit there, a little bit of rocking there. Nothing else really, but if I flip it over, now, and I'm gonna turn this so you can maybe see it. Now what you're gonna see is it rocking end to end. Okay, it's not doing so much this way, but it's rocking end to end. That means there's, there's a bow in it, okay? It's bent like that. This other one, I can't remember what this other one, what problem this other one had. Oh, this one's pretty obvious, okay? Same thing, it's got another bow in it. If you look at the ends of the board, they're not touching there and there, so it's gonna rock this way. Okay, if I flip it over, you should see a gap at the center of the board. The gap right here at the center of the board, it's touching at the ends and there's a gap at the center. So we have to correct that. That's what I mean by a board not being square, okay? Okay, there's no way I can actually show that other thing I want to show you, but it's just not possible without you guys physically being here. So that's part of what we're trying to do. We're gonna start our process of squaring a board by flattening one surface, okay? We're gonna flat, flatten one face, okay? So I'm just gonna grab a different board because I wanna use those next period. So here's a random piece of alder. Got a little twist in it, okay? So it's got a little bit of a, a twist in it. Um, so, so you understand this, we're gonna talk about how jo joiner functions and how it does what it does real quick. Um, I finally turned it the right way. Okay, first of all, we'll start with the parts of the joiner, okay? This is the in feed table. This is the out feed table. In other words, you start by feeding your board from the in feed table to the out feed table, right? Go in, comes out. This is our fence. The fence should be 90 degrees to the table, okay? 
should be 90 degrees to the table. Just like on the table saw, the blade on the table saw needs to be 90 degrees to the table. Okay. Now, there's our fence, in feet table, out feet table. This is our guard. Okay, this guard will always be in place. You can never move it out of the way when you're when you're joining a board. Inside here, you should be able to see. All right, there's our, and I went the wrong way again. I can never figure this out. This is called a helical head joiner, okay? So in other words, if you look, you can see how the cutters, these are all individual little cutters on here, and they're kind of at an angle, right? A sheer angle, okay? There's row after row after row of cutters in here. In fact, there's 54 individual solid carbide knives on this joiner, okay? The way you set up a joiner and the way it works, if I take a flat, surface like the edge of this square and I set it on the out feet table and if I rotate this cutter head by hand watch my square as soon as this cutter reaches its the top of its arc its apogee its apex when it's at the top of its rotation it should just barely touch that square see that you can see that blade is able to move that let me do it this way so you think no I'm not cheating Okay, so that cutter head, that outfeed table is set at the exact height that these cutter heads come to. On the other hand, our infeed table, if you can see it, there's a gap between my square and the infeed table. It's about a sixteenth of an inch. So this infeed table is set about a sixteenth of an inch below the cutter head, the top of the cutter head, and the outfeed table. That sixteenth of an inch is how much material we're gonna remove with each pass on the joiner. If I set this in-feed bed a quarter inch below the out-feed bed, every time you made a pass through the joiner, it's gonna take off a quarter inch of material, okay? So this is set to remove about a sixteenth of an inch of material, okay? Now there's a problem here though. What a lot of people don't understand is that the way you feed a board through the joiner is pretty important. If I'm putting a board through the joiner, let me back this up. So that you know, if you didn't already, whenever you use the joiner, you have to use push pads. You cannot put bare hands on this board. When you're face joining a board, and when you're face joining a board, you gotta use a pad, okay? So we're gonna have two pads on this board, okay? Now, if this board was shaped like the bottom of a boat, a boat like this, okay? And we just went through like this, all we're gonna do is make it a skinny board that's still got a bow in it, okay? Where you place pressure on the board as it goes into and out of the joiner matters, okay? So as, I'm, as my board is entering the joiner, that's where my pressure is, okay? I've also got light pressure back here. Once I get here, now my front push pad is past the cutter head. I'm gonna maintain pressure on the out feed table. I'm gonna lighten up on my pressure on the end feed table. In other words, I don't want to be pushing down on both of these pads as I'm going through the cutter head. Okay, very light pressure back here, just enough to feed it into the blade. Good pressure here. Okay, so most of my pressure as I'm exiting this cutter head is going to be on the out feed side. Minimal amount of pressure on the end feed side. Otherwise, I'm just pushing this down and bending it as it's going, it's going through. I'm not going to accomplish anything. It's a simple matter, and another thing about this machine, if you haven't been in this shop before, um, I probably should say this. A um, couple things that we don't allow out here, we don't allow students to wear earbuds or headphones. Um, we don't allow students to wear gloves. Um, we do require students to wear safety glasses, but there's a reasoning behind that that I want you guys to understand. Okay. A lot of the machines in here require your sense of hearing, um, your sense of touch, things like that. And the joiner is a really good example of using both, okay? Um, nine times out of 10, when you're jointing the edge of a board, and, and the definition of jointing the edge of a board is flattening, straightening, and squaring the edge of a board. When you joint the face of a board, you're flattening the face of the board. All the machines in this shop make a very particular sound when they're running. 
Um, they make a particular sound when they're running correctly, when they're running incorrectly. Um, they make a particular sound when they're being force fed with too much pressure um, or not fed fast enough. Um, very particular sound. And it, it's a very partic particular feel on your fingertips when you're feeding a board through a machine, the table saw, something like that. The joiner is really a good example because you can tell, nine times out of 10, you can tell when you have successfully jointed the edge of a board, when it's done, when it's good, flat, straight, and square, by the sound that the joiner makes, okay? Um, you'll hear the sound of contact of the blades to the edge of the board or the face of the board, and the sounds of minimal contact, more contact. In other words, you're gonna, once you run this machine a couple times, you're gonna know by the sound of it when you're done joining the edge of a board. Um, one of the things that we're trying to accomplish when we joint the edge of a board is just like I said, we're trying to flatten, straighten, and square the edge. Now it may take one pass through the joiner. It may take five or six, depending on how jacked up the edge of this board is. You don't know until you walk up here and start putting this through the machine, okay? But you can tell by the sound that the machine makes as it's cutting, when it's done. You don't want to join any more, you don't want to make any more passes on this than you have to, okay? neglected to say that. And you can also tell by how much pressure it takes to feed the board through the cutter head. In other words, if I'm cutting a lot, like in this area, in this area, then all of a sudden, this has got a big gap in it. It's not doing much cutting right here. It's going to slide right across that table till you reach the back here where it's cutting again. So the pressure that you have on the board with your fingers, with your hands, with the pads, um, can tell you a lot about how far you come and the sound the machine makes. Um, a real, another good example is our band saws. Band saws work using a continuous loop blade. We happen to have a couple of 14 inch band saws um, that have about a 97 and a half inch blade um, and then a couple others. Um, all these blades are manufactured by taking a giant spool of this band saw blade material and cutting it at specific lengths and then tack welding the ends together, okay? And then grinding it smooth. If you're running the bandsaw and you turn it on, you don't even have to be putting any material through it. You turn it on and you hear a consistent tick, 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 tick sound. That means the blade is cracked. Most likely it's cracked at the weld. That's where they break most often. But if you hear that consistent tick, tick, tick sound as you turn on a bandsaw, turn it off. It's cracked, it's going to break, all right? So our sense of hearing is very important here. Um, our sense of touch is very important here. Even our sense of smell, you can smell when the edge of a board is, is being burned because your feed rate in the table saw is too slow um, or the blade's too dull. Um, I mean, that's a good example of a burn mark on a piece of maple. You know, you can see the burn mark on the end of this board. You can smell that when it's burning. Um, once you've been out here enough, you'll be able to tell by the sense of smell what kind of wood is being cut. You'll know if somebody's cutting pine, you'll smell it. Um, if you cut enough oak, you'll know when somebody's cutting oak because you'll smell it. It smells terrible. Um, walnut tends to smell a little bit like chocolate, people say, when it's being cut. Um, there's another type of material I haven't had here in a long, long time that smells like buttered popcorn when it's being cut. Another one smells like garlic bread when it's being cut. So there's distinct odors as well. So we use all our senses in here. Um, it's very important. So I've gotten off track, but first step in squaring a board, Joint one face, try and get one face flat, okay? The second step in squaring a board is to take this board over to the planer, put the jointed face down because the cutter head on the planer is above. It's gonna remove material from the upper surface. And we're going to plane the opposite surface. In other words, we're gonna remove material from the opposite face. That's gonna accomplish a couple different things. Number one, it's gonna get us down to the final thickness that we want. Say the plans are calling for something a half inch thick and you start with something an inch thick, inch thick. We're talking about this dimension right here, okay? The thickness of the board, okay? This is the width of the board. This is the length of the board. This is the thickness of the board. That is dimensional, has nothing to do with grain, okay? Um, so the jointed face is down, the upper face is planed, and it gets us to our final thickness that we want. The other thing, and just as important, if not more important, it creates two 
parallel faces. The planer is going to make it so that both of these faces are parallel to each other, okay? So that no matter where you measure the thickness, you take a tape or a pair of calibers or something like that, you start measuring the thickness all over the place, doesn't matter where you measure it, it's going to be the same. Those two faces are parallel to each other. In other words, if these two faces of this board were extended out into space, kept going, okay, they would never get any closer to each other and they'd never diverge from each other. Okay, so that's what parallel means. So that's the second and just as important aspect of what the planer is doing, is it's creating two parallel faces. So once we walk away from the planer, we've got two parallel faces. The board's a consistent thickness. We can measure that thickness anywhere and it's gonna be what we want, all right? So we come back to the joiner. Now that we have two good faces, we can stand that board on edge, hold it, hold its face tight to the fence, and we can joint one edge, flatten, straighten, and square one edge, okay? It won't do any good to joint an edge of this board that you have not flattened the faces, okay? It's not gonna do any good. For example, if this board happened to be three inches thick at this edge and a half inch thick at this edge, and you go and put it up against this fence, it's gonna be sticking out like this. In other words, it's going to be against the fence. Instead of being square against the fence, it's going to be sitting at an angle because it's way thicker at the top than it is the bottom edge. Okay? You're not going to get a 90 degree edge. It has to be tight to the fence and flat against the fence to be able to create a 90 degree edge. Okay? So you have to have flat parallel faces before you can joint an edge or it does no good. All right? So you joint the edge. Okay? It may take you a single pass through the machine. It may take you more than one. Let's run this. I'll set it up so you can hear the difference, hopefully. Um, give me a second. So what I have is a board that I've manufactured with a bad edge. Okay, it's got a bad edge here. So hopefully you can hear this. Um, I don't know how well this might pick this stuff up, but I'm also at the same time, I'm gonna take a pencil. I'm just gonna mark up this edge, okay? So we can tell visually too. But what I want you to get out of this is the sound it makes as it's being jointed, okay? So I place the long edge or the long surface against the fence, never the short. Okay, we do not do that. My board's at least 12 inches long. We cannot join the board unless it's at least 12 inches long. It's unsafe. That's also in the safety test. I've got my push pad. I'm gonna use the push pad here. I'm gonna use my fingers on the back corner back here. Okay, and I want you to listen to the machine. Hopefully you guys heard that. Get joined this area right here with the pencil marks. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. Run it again. Okay. Now we're down to it being about this much space that hasn't been joined. So the next pass, it should be a consistent sound along the length of the entire length of the board. Okay. Nice consistent sound along the entire length. So that board has been joined. We've got one, one jointed edge. Also, what that's accomplished, since we had two flat parallel faces to be able to join this edge, not only do we have a nice flat, straight, square edge, but we've created our first two 90 degree angles. That jointed edge is now 90 degrees to that flat face and it's now 90 degrees to that flat face, okay? So, what do we got here? Oh, we're gonna run out of time, aren't we? Okay, so we're gonna stop there. Um, so just, just to recap this, okay? Faces, then edges, then ends. Joiner, planer, joiner, table saw, 
miter saw, miter saw, okay? Square means 90 degrees. It's a physical measurement, okay? Dimensional analysis of a board. I'm sorry, physical, dimensional. Square, not 12 by 12, 90 degrees, okay? Faces, edges, and ends are defined by dimensions. Face grain, edge grain, and end grain is defined by the structural or physical characteristics of the characteristics of the board. Okay, so we got through joiner. Um, we'll continue on tomorrow. Um, so I don't think anybody else showed up late. Um, I think that's it. So do me a favor. Thank you to those those of you that got here on time today. I appreciate it tremendously. Um, what we do for attendance is make sure you type your name in the chat window before you leave. Um, that's it for today. Take care of yourselves. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. All right. Have a great evening.